So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you today, the Camaragal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Kelly Mitchell from the Historical Services team at Stanton Library. And I have the pleasure of introducing North Sydney Council's historian, Dr Ian Hoskins, for the latest in our online history talk series. And uh, the first, I believe, for this year, for 2023, um, History of North Sydney's Natural History. Um, please do keep an eye on our newly redesigned website, as you'll notice, um, for details of upcoming talks. Um, and if you've missed any previous talks from last year, then uh, those recordings are available to watch online. And you can find the links via the Heritage Centre page on our website. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, then feel free to write them into the chat box and I can put them to Ian for a short Q&A um, at the end of this presentation. Um, but for any other general inquiries, requests for digital images and so on, then please email us at uh, localhistory at northsydney.nsw.gov.au. Um, and for now, I will hand over to Ian for his presentation. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Kelly. And, um, hello, everyone, and thanks for, for joining us. Um, the, I've, I've been at council now for uh, 20 years this year, so <laughs> um, I, I prompted by that sudden realisation, I thought I should uh, start thinking about writing a, another history of North Sydney. There have been several written in the past um, of varying quality. The most recent one, um, and the best general history, came out in 1988, so it's, in itself it's quite old. Uh, and, you know, I've discovered things besides along the way. So that, that's my big project between now and retiring, where, whenever that may be. And I've, I've essentially begun at the beginning by looking at natural history. And what I'm going to do today is a little different to what I normally do. I, I scroll through pictures and chat and tell you what I know about each picture and we uh, 45 minutes later, that's the end of that. This afternoon, I've scripted something. So it's a, essentially a draft of a chapter on the natural history of North Sydney. Um, so we'll see how that goes and, and well illustrated. You don't just have to listen to me droning on. There'll be lots of pictures. Uh, but I'd be very interested to know your um, opinion of the of the piece. And if particularly if you have any more information about anything I've said or anything I haven't said besides your knowledge of um, uh, the, the forests of North Sydney, the, the wildlife and et cetera. You may be bush care workers or whatever who have um, insights into things that, that I don't. So um, anyway, let, so let's kick off. And as I said, I'll be reading out a script. Now, much of North Sydney straddles a ridge that runs east-west from Mossman to Wollstonecraft. I'll try <laughs> not having much luck getting this one to, there we are, move along. A relatively flat, broad plateau on top of this high ground sits some 90 metres above sea level. The land descends steeply on the north side to Middle Harbour and in a steadier slope to the main harbour on the south. The slopes are rippled with cloth-like folds that alternately create the points and coves of Middle Harbour to the north and the southern foreshore fronting the harbour's main channel. This topography is higher and steeper than that on the other side of the harbour where the city of Sydney sits. 22, 10 to 20,000 years ago, the folds descended down another 20 or so metres to rivers and creeks that had cut through the sandstone bedrock over a much longer time frame. Remarkably, the main valley under Sydney Harbour was, and in large part, um, was in large part created by the modest freshwater stream that still flows in present day Parramatta after the confluence of the Toongabbie and Darling Mills Creeks. The sea entered the head some six to 10,000 years ago to drown that valley and make the harbour that, that we know today. Most of the so-called Parramatta River is in hydrological and ecological terms, a part of Sydney Harbour and not a river as the Murray, Darling and Murrumbidgee are so regarded. It was naturally a tidal and saline estuary for some 18 of its 21 kilometre length with a section of brackish water beyond that. A weir now abruptly separates fresh and salt water up at Parramatta. Well, the Lane Cove River just to the west of North Sydney was likewise originally estuarine for five to 10 kilometres of its length. 
before the insertion of a weir in the 20th century and interrupted the natural mix of fresh and saline water halfway along its length. Middle Harbour, which gives North Sydney its northern waterfront, was formed by the flooding of a valley cut by several small creeks. Much of Middle Harbour Creek at its upper, uh, very upper reaches is regarded as a drowned river valley estuary. Now, intertidal shores in Sydney Harbour and North Sydney are typically flat or gently sloped rock platforms. Vertical surfaces are naturally quite rare. This affects the endemic organisms which naturally assemble around the waterline, including limpets, marine worms, barnacles and encrusting algae. The Sydney rock oyster was and still is commonplace. So to the zebra top snail, which looks like a tiny striped turban, the mud oyster, Australia and Garci was once common to such ecosystem, but is rare if not extinct in the wild in Sydney Harbour. The contours which have produced North Sydney's many coves were formed by ancient geological uplift and erosive runoff from the plateau and freshwater creeks flowing downhill from springs emerging higher up. Tiny Spring Street in the centre of the central business district gets its name from the stream which emanated from the ground somewhere near the junction of Berry Street and the Pacific Highway to ultimately feed Careening Cove. When the harbour was fully formed, these creeks spilled out onto silty sandy flats. With one exception at the head of Shoal Cove on the western side of Cremorne Point, all these have been filled in or reclaimed as the terminology goes for human use. Elsewhere, there are small beaches or rock outcrops and platforms with sandy soil behind or above. The largest of these creeks flowed um, along the northern slope into Middle Harbour from a spring near the corner of present day Falcon and West Streets. It passed through a forest and literally spilled into Long Bay in a waterfall rather than seeping out through a tidal flat like the other streams. Thousands of years of flow created a reservoir at the base called the Devil's Pool by Europeans. And this was one of the most painted and photographed uh, landmarks on the north side regarded as a beauty spot. Roughly 5% of North Sydney is still forested and these reserves have been much altered by non-endemic plants, both native and exotic. The intentional and incidental planting Transplanting of flora has been dramatic. This change first affected the southern foreshore from Blues Point to Kirribilli and then spread east, west and north as Crown land was sold and early colonial era estates were subdivided. Before that, trees grew down to the water around most of the shoreline. The typical red for the forest red gum foreshore and Angophora foreshore forests were dominated respectively by forest red gums and the Sydney red gum, uh, we often call that the Angophora. Gophra costata, um, whose smooth pinkish roots cl you know, still cling to rocks and penetrate shallow soil like contorted muscular legs supporting trunks of up to 15 metres. Swamp oak might also have lined waterfront rock platforms. Well, the red gum coexisted with Sydney peppermint and red bloodwood, the plant that gave rise to the colonial name gum tree because of its thick oozing sap. All belong to the family Metaceae and have similar ring-like clusters of blossom. The former uh, gut eucalypts differ from the Angophora in subtle ways, such as the arrangement of their leaves. The former sit alternatively on each side of the twig, while the latter grow opposite each other. The understory beneath these trees typically consists of banksias, grevilleas and many other varieties of shrubs and grasses. An 1820s watercolour by convict artist Joseph Lysett shows vegetation above the foreshore rocks at Kirribilli or Milsons Point in the earliest years of European occupation. It is therefore some guide to the area's endem endemic flora. Admittedly, this was the site of the first colonial land grant, 1794, and the relative sparseness and prevalence of grass depicted may be a result of clearing. However, three species are clearly identifiable, 
a swamp or forest oak. And that's here. The grass tree there. And the burrowing or cycad here. The latter typically grows in shade, possibly provided once by the tree shown shattered on the left of the artwork, like possibly was struck by lightning. That seemed to be a, a, a prevalent cause of um, tree loss in the, in the early years of the, of the colony. Microclimates formed in some of the coves where cool shade and abundant water created rainforest-like conditions. Indeed, these are referred to as sandstone gallery rainforests. One of the best descriptions of such a place in Neutral Bay comes from Livingston Mann, who grew up in the area from 1863, before extensive clearing and roadworks destroyed the existing ecology. He recalled that that time when he was in his early 70s, so in the 1930s, and much had changed. To quote him, beautiful clear streams trickled down the slopes of the hilly background to the deeper ravines of the eastern side of Neutral Bay, falling before they reached the sea over fern-covered cliffs, making miniature waterfalls and even moistening the water-loving plants that grew and shaded the gullies. Well, farther up the rise, um, what he called an almost impregnable forest, ran to Middle Harbour on the other side of the plateau. And it was one abounding in an understory of wildflowers, including what he um, recalled as the five corner, the G-bung and the native current. Now this may have been one of the foreshore forests I described earlier, but mixed also with scribbly gum and stringy bark. But man's use of the term almost impregnable suggests also two possibilities. The first is the forest made dense by the absence of Aboriginal people, almost certainly thin the understory by cool burns in order to ease travel and minimise the danger of catastrophic bushfires caused by the build-up of fuel. Or, alternatively, may, man may have been describing the denser black butt and Sydney blue gum association of the North Shore High Forest. These trees grew more densely on the clay soil along the spine from Mossman to Camaray, but also to the west and north in present-day North uh, Crosnes, sorry, and Wilsoncraft. Black butts and blue gums are tall straight trees with small, with smooth silvery upper trunks and branches. Their bark peels in strips lower down. Turpentine might also be found in this forest type where the soil is deep and rich enough. They too are tall and straight, but with thick grooved bark. These forests and woodlands supported a complex array of faunal communities of insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Before Europeans came to Sydney Harbour in 1788, the local Gamaragal people impacted primarily through their controlled burns. Hunting and gathering had little impact by virtue of the small population, perhaps 150 or 200 people spread over at least 15 square kilometres. Fish and shellfish were their main source of nutrition, and this harvest was spread over the longshore line and many coves. However, an Aboriginal rock engraving in Neutral Bay, next to the line of Ben Boyd Road, showed a grazing emu. I suspect there's a house <laughs> built over this now, which accords with the bird's habitat of that um, foreshore forest. Livingston Man mentioned bandicoots as well and ring-tailed opossums, as he called them, in connection with the shaded spots of Neutral Bay. Other colonial era accounts refer to the lower North Shore teeming with kangaroos and wallabies. There would have been a variety of smaller marsupials too, such as the brown antichinus. Before rapacious sport hunting by colonists and the introduction of cats, dogs, and foxes had decimated local fauna, the eastern and spotted quolls were the top endemic non-human predator. It is unlikely those mammals survived the first century of European occupation in North Sydney. There was a possible local sighting of an eastern quoll in the 1950s, but I suspect this is unlikely as they were already extinct on the mainland by the 1960s, and it was unlikely there was a holdout in, in well-developed North Sydney um, just before that. Quolls may have competed with dingoes. Possibly they were preyed upon by these larger predators. Dingoes were introduced to Northern Australia from Southeast Asia or New Guinea, perhaps 5,000 years ago, and had migrated south by the 18th century for the first European accounts referred to the close relationship between those dogs and Aboriginal people. Uh, 
It's not clear from those accounts whether dingoes were also to be found wild around the harbour. Mann also referred to the curlew, possibly or probably the eastern curlew, a migratory wader which fed on the tidal flats by sticking its long curved beak into the mud or sand, searching for mollusks or small crabs. It is a shy bird, which may explain its popularity as a target for colonial hunters. That name was widely applied to watercraft in the late 19th century, the name curlew, and may also reflect the prevalence of the curlew on harbour foreshores, at least during the summer months before it returned to Russia and other northern regions to breed. The eastern curlew is now listed as critically endangered by the Australian government. The colonial proclivity for killing sometimes moved beyond bloodlust to intellectual curiosity. In the 19th century, thousands of creatures were shot, trapped, hooked or netted for inclusion in natural history collections. Many of these were donated to the Australian Museum. And in the 1860s and 70s, lists of contributions and the area in which they were sourced were published in the Sydney newspapers. Those represent a rich source of natural history information in the years before widespread local extinctions and depletion. Well, Frederick Arthur and his son Charles and daughter Mary Jane were particular keen and generous collectors. In 1854, Frederick presented a live quoll and two dead white-throated goat suckers to the museum. The latter were probably the owlet nightjar, a nocturnal insect feeder, more often heard than seen. They were killed in December, which means they were likely breeding either as a pair or two halves of two pairs, which typically share parenting. Any eggs would therefore have become unviable and the chicks would probably have died. Arthur probably shot the ringtail possum he donated in 1855 and caught the sleeping lizard handed in that year also. That was likely a pink, tongue, uh, pink tongued skink. Frederick shot and gifted a female coal, then called a coat in 1857. We're all familiar with those. That bird was a spring and summer migrant like the Eastern curlew and the channel bill cuckoo, noted by officers of the first fleet. The remarkable natural history artist, Sarah Stone, painted a cuckoo probably from a skin sent back in 1788. With the rise of urban populations, um, well, alongside urban populations of, of adaptive larger birds such as ravens and currawongs, um, the nests of uh, whose nests the cuckoo use for their own parasitic offspring, the call of the raucous channel bill is still a feature of summer months around the harbour. Well, Frederick's son Charles whoops, shot uh, a sugar glider in 1854 and did the same with a yellow bellied, uh, sorry, a, a white bellied water rat from the waterfall at Long Bay in 1855. The latter dig burrows in the banks of rivers, creeks, and water holes and feed on crustacea, frogs, insects, um, and fish, if there are any. There would have been an abundance of frogs around the deep clear waterfall there at Willoughby, species such as the brown striped frog and the common eastern froglet. There are still apparently water rats in North Sydney. Um, oops. The tiny glider fed on the nectar of eucalypt blossoms and grevillea and banksia flowers. They are no longer to be found locally. Mary Jane Arthur was a rare example of a female collector. In 1854, she caught and donated an iguana, which was probably a water dragon. The boys of the North Shore were, it seems, avid collectors. Insects were probably easier to acquire than mammals. In 1854, one Master Younger, a contemporary of young Charles Arthur, donated a hawk moth. The caterpillars of those fed on the leaves of eucalypts and g-bungs, among other plants. Master E.A. Dunn, Court and donated a specimen of the striking pink winged phasma in 1856. That leaf eating insect is also endemic to eucalypt forests. But the trees were also filled with marsupials of various sorts and guns were available to children as well as adults. In 1857, Master John Connor shot or caught a flying possum identified as Puterista solureus but which may in fact have been the yellow-bellied glider or squirrel glider. Uh, 
In 1859, local hotelier, William Dined, donated an unusual white, possibly an albino brush-tailed possum. And in 1861, Henry Dodds donated another tree-dwelling marsupial, what the newspaper referred to as a pencil-tailed fasagale, but today is known as the brush-tailed fasagale. It is a carnivorous relation of the quoll, much reduced in its range across the state, and almost certainly locally extinct like its spotted cousin. The area abounded in reptiles, probably more than the 16 terrestrial species still to be found in North Sydney. Mary Jane Arthur's Eastern Water Dragon is one of these. It shared freshwater habitats with the water rat. Burton's legless lizard is another endemic survivor, living in woodland and sheltering and laying its eggs under logs. Mr. R.J. Hall, who lived in a large house called Weir Weir on the western shore of Careening Cove, presented one of these creatures to the museum in 1861. In 1854, Mr. P.F. Cummins donated a diamond python, while in 1876, Mr. G. Wright caught or killed and presented a specimen of Stephen's banded snake and a green tree snake, all a tree dwelling snakes, but the banded snake is the only venomous species of the trio. It is possibly locally extinct. Birds were plentiful, although the pink headed dove shot in 1861 by James Wallace Jr. of Crow's Nest must have been a rarity. Now called the rose crown fruit dove, that hapless individual was probably a vagrant as the species does not normally venture south of Port Stephens and prefers tropical climes. Far more usual were the vast flocks of bronze winged pigeons and parrots that reportedly filled trees and perhaps the skies in the early to mid 19th century to the delight of shooters. The latter were probably lorikeets or maybe cockatoos. Lorikeets have maintained their presence through their aggressive and noisy dispositions. Rosellas, eastern and crimson are shire and do not gather in large flocks, but were undoubtedly present in previous centuries as they are today in fewer numbers. Yellow black, yellow tailed black cockatoos often travel in threes and still can be seen locally. The bronze winged pigeon, shot and trapped for target practice, has disappeared from North Sydney. Wattle birds feed on both insects and the nectar of flowering shrubs and trees. First re referred to as the wattle bee eater, they were commonly called gill birds in the 19th century because of the coloured flaps on each side of the beak. An area near the suspension bridge at Camaray was called Gilbert Ground by the 1880s. Presumably because of their abundance, these would have been the red and little wattle bird. Well, as late as 1885, one commentator on North Shore matters, quote, wrote of the natural wonders still to be encountered beyond the town of St. Leonard's. On the western side of the settlement was the well-forested Wilson Craft Berry Estate, yet to be subdivided. To the north and east was Camaray, still largely uncleared. And north of Neutral Bay and Cremorne remained wooded. The bush, enthused this writer, quote, is still alive with gillbirds, parrots, quail, thrush, coachmen and honeysuckers. These birds were probably the brown or, uh, sorry, the brown or painted button quail and the gray shrike thrust. The coachmen were likely whip birds, their responsive call cracking like horse whips. Honeysuckers were certainly honey eaters of which several species might've been found locally. The New Holland, the yellow faced, the yellow tufted and the white ear among the white eared among them. The eastern spinebill was another nectar eater that was probably commonplace. This was a contemporary account reporting on what was still to be seen. Reminiscences such as those of Livingston Mann focused on wildlife and flora which had vanished. He finished his 1932 recollection with the observation that the birds have encountered on his youthful rambles had long left to seek some spot away from the abode of man. 
man himself wondered where the redheads and diamond sparrows had gone. These are red brow finches, and today what are called diamond firetails. By then, the only large, by then 1932, the only large undisturbed disturbed patches of endemic bushland in North Sydney were to be found on the steep slopes leading down to Flat Rock Creek, which fed Long Bay and Middle Harbour, and possibly Berry Island. Surveys conducted 20 years ago suggest that both have um, both species of birds have retreated to patches of endemic forest to the east that were resumed as defence lands in the 1860s and subsequently protected as part of Sydney Harbour National Park in the 1970s. I should mention at this point um, a list of fauna to, that have been seen in areas like uh, Dobroyd Head, part of uh, the Sydney Harbour National Park, uh, put together by Nicholas Skelton, that's S-K-E-L-T-O-N, uh, in 2004. I've only got a, a hard copy available, but I'll be using that to inform my um, the, the chapter that I write on, on natural history. But there's a really interesting list of um, amphibians, birds, reptiles, and mammals, if you can find a copy of that somewhere. The wildlife that once, oh, I'm sorry, um, another unnamed correspondent writing in the women's page of the Daily Telegraph recalled the historic valley of Flat Rock Creek and Willoughby Falls in the 1860s from the perspective of, the 19, of 1916, after the first subdivisions had been carved out of the forest nearby. It was, she wrote, a beautifully wild and weirdly interesting locality where wonga pigeons and lyrebirds could be found. Christmas bush and other wildflowers such as waratah abounded as did snakes. The author's father had come across a 30 foot long python during her childhood. The writer expressed a sense of remorse similar to that of man. Quote, we see the, be the beauty spots bit by bit being gradually wiped out with a sense of heavy loss. In 1916, suburban subdivisions were beginning to change the Berry Estate in the west and the vast Cooper Estate, which comprised much of Neutral Bay, giving the municipality of North Sydney its characteristic Red Roof Federation era housing stock. Even in northerly Camaray, dairy farms and market gardens were being carved up for housing. The creek leading to Willoughby Falls was covered over where the houses were built. The flats below the falls had been turned into a sewage farm in the 1890s, no doubt to the detriment of local populations of water rats and other creatures. The reservation of land around much of the creek for what became Camaray Park as early as 1838 preserved the, the forest there until the end of the 19th century, although the area was also used by gun clubs for target shooting, a practice that no doubt impacted badly on fauna in the area. There followed pressure from footballers and cricketers and the creation um, thereby followed of a formal park and playing fields. Camaray Golf Club was established in late 1906 and council agreed to their playing in Camaray Park shortly before or after that. By 1908, a six hole course had been constructed. The wildlife that had once flourished in that forest was forced to retreat to ever shrinking habitats along Flat Rock Creek, just as the creatures of the woods to the west in the Berry Estate were left with the escarpment down to Gore Cove, what would become Smoothie Park after the transfer of undeveloped estate land to council in 1915. In 1916, both Berry Island and Ball's Head were wildlife havens, but in the 1920s, when both were declared public reserves, these sites were dramatically deforested. Now, for a long time, I thought Berry Island um, had has remained sort of undisturbed Angophora forest. I've been telling many people that um, compared to Ball's Head, which was pretty well um, denuded of everything in the 1920s. But I since discovered this aerial photograph of uh, Berry Island, 1930, and it looks, <laughs> it looks itself deforested. You can see a ring of trees, which are probably Angophora's around the foreshore, but the top of it is really denuded. So that suggests that all the angophras there or the um the red forest gums 
uh, have grown up since the 1930s, much as the um, the, the stock of trees on Ball's Head have been uh, have have grown back since the 1930s. Well, Ball's Head was purposely replanted with a mix of exotics and native non-endemic species, such as Acacia alata or winged wattle, while the pre-existing Angophora dominated forest on Berry Island was apparently allowed to regenerate naturally from existing trees and dormant seeds. In time, endemic species would return to Ball's Head as well. So there are quite a lot of Angophora trees there and they haven't been replanted to my knowledge. So probably have grown from seed that was in the in the soil after um, all the, the chopping was carried out in the 1920s. Since the 1980s, these and other forested reserves in North Sydney have been managed with a view to returning as many locally endemic plants as possible so they might provide shelter and food for the animals that have survived the impact of Europeans for over 230 years. This has sometimes involved controlled burns. A 2010 natural area survey listed around 150 native animals um, seen since 2000 and most were birds. Um, there's been no more recent survey to my knowledge, but it would be interesting to see whether that's that number of 150 has risen or decreased. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, and particularly for those fantastic photographs there. Such beautiful lithographs and the, yeah, the, the illustrations. Yeah. I particularly <laughs> wanted to choose colonial era illustrations to give you a sense of the of the time and how um, the colonists were were viewing and understanding the the, the wildlife around them. So um, there's a rich source of those at the State Library and the National Library, but we do have a few in our collection as well, as you probably saw. Indeed. Um, so, does anyone have any? Questions for Ian. There's um we don't have anything in the chat box just now. Let's see if anything pops into anyone's mind. Oh uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Um, sure. Okay. Sorry, my name's Ken Robinson. I live um, in Waverton. Um, I was just wondering about um, some of your sources uh, for the information. Obviously, you, you you have quite a extent there. Uh, I'm, a couple of books have come come to my mind from from a long time ago. One was by a fellow called Doug Benson. Yes, they're taken for granted. Uh, you, I take it you're aware of. That. Yeah, indeed, I use that um, extensively. Yeah, we got a copy here in the Heritage Centre collection. Yeah, I don't suppose there's a new edition out by any chance. No, it's pretty old, isn't it? Um, and I'm not aware of a new edition. And interestingly. I, I use that initially and, and derive my terminology of different um, forest associations and all the rest from that book. And another even older book, if you can just excuse me for a moment, Ken, I'll reach over and find it. Lovely edition, but pretty old now. Here it is. Um, called Nature and a City, the Na Native Vegetation of the Sydney Area by M. Carts off, so that that goes back to the 1960s or 70s, but is useful for discussion of the the trees that normally associate with each other in in various parts of Sydney. So those two plus various other the native plants of the Sydney region, Margaret Barker, Robin Corringham, and Jill Dark, um, Jill Dark. and and on it, yeah. Do you want me to repeat that? Did you? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. However, what, what I've just dis discovered um, is with the reconfiguration of the North Sydney Council website, which has only been launched literally today, um, yes, there no. is, <laughs> yeah, there's a very interesting uh, list of PDFs that you can download if you go into uh, the section to deal with biodiversity, or if you type in biodiversity in the search bar, mm. you will get a list of um, other forest types that are not terms that were used in the Benson book or any of the others I've mentioned. So the um, the red forest gum foreshore forest, I think is is that red gum foreshore forest is, is one of those. These are ones that I'm still coming to terms with. So it'd be worth um, calling through the yeah, the North Sydney Council site for those for those documents. I hadn't seen them before the um the reconfiguration, so I was desperately doing some. Uh, rewriting this morning as I saw those terms. 
Is that useful? Um, yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, don't take this personally, but uh, you're an historian. Um, who are, who are you using to help you with the biodiversity issues? Well, I've, I do talk to our bush care people. Yeah, indeed. And before any of this is published, I can assure you they'll have a, a proper read of it all. Yeah. So I'm uh, very aware that species types change their names. Yeah, they <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> um, and and as I've just indicated, you know, the, the references that different types of forests, or excuse me, um, different types of forests uh, change also as we understand more and more about them. That's what I was getting at was many years ago when I, I did this some of this sort of stuff um, as an undergraduate and postgraduate. Mm. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to people either at the museum or and particularly at, at, the, at the Botanic Gardens, the, the National Herbarium there. And that's where Doug Benson and, and Jocelyn Howell were. Oh, yes. I don't know whether such a service still exists but but uh i found it extremely useful to oh thank you for that tip yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah so i'll um, i'll make sure that the people who know far more about it than i do read this yeah before it goes into print and we have really really excellent uh, well but it, the section is called open spaces and environmental services and the mm -hmm. subset of that is bush care and these are the guys who know how to do the controlled burns and yeah, yeah they're out and about and and in fact, one of them there, the photograph I've got up, Tristram Thomas. I should um, <laughs> acknowledge yeah. Tristram, who's been with us for a, for a long time and is so knowledgeable, yeah. and um, and he's a good photographer too. Okay. Uh, the other question I had is, uh, you do, you mentioned um, a few uh, uh, aquatic species, I suppose, Austria, Angus, I being one. Yeah. Uh, are you um, doing anything about the the intertidal or subtidal? areas or is there any bushland you're going to deal with well I, I i mentioned those in this talk and i'll i i'll stick to the intertidal areas so i'll talk a bit more about the um, when the time comes about the shellfish to be found around there and that'll lead in usefully to the to the next chapter in which i talk about camaragal people because they really did rely on um, shellfish and pinfish but i'm not going to go out too much into the harbor with all the different types of fish I imagine there yeah there's lots of what I was thinking of was more the um, the change in vegetation caused by uh, development in the catchment where you have a lot of sediment coming down lots right of, lots of salt marsh areas yeah replacement with mangrove areas yeah I'm not maybe you can help me then Ken because I'm not that sure where there may have been salt marsh in North Sydney mm -hmm. um that has been replaced by mangrove. I know that's definitely the case further up the Parramatta River, and yes. and 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 in Lane Cove in particular. Indeed, yeah, and and a mistake that I've made in the past, and uh, was looking at the mangrove and thinking, isn't that beaut? You know, there's all this mangrove and nature's coming back. But discovered <laughs> after re reading a, a very interesting article, which is now itself quite old but still very useful, by Lynn McLaughlin. Yes. on the Parramatta River and, and mangroves to say that well a lot of those mangroves are colonizing um areas silted up by I suppose that's where the, I was leading because I was, I'm familiar with Lynn McLaughlin's work a, a lot from a long time ago like you yeah uh, it's, uh, and uh I remember all that and I do know that at University of New South Wales uh there were a number of students looking at, at a similar sort of issue mm. with the loss of salt you know, changes in salt marsh mangroves yeah habitat caused by whatever's going on on the land base but uh, um okay uh yeah my, my third sorry i'm going to dominate this for a moment <laughs> That's my, of time. my third point was is, is a minor one but uh some years ago i was i was doing some work on um, on plague in sydney and uh, i came across a paper which may be of interest uh, it was uh, by a couple of uh, biologists who were who are mounting an argument that the loss of native bush rats in, in on the certainly on the north shore because it you know they're not found anywhere near the harbor anymore and he he was or the, they were attributing it possibly to um what happened during plague years in the early 1900s when there was a bounty put out on rats 
and for six. Oh my goodness! And right. you, you, collect, you, know, you had sixpence for each rat you brought in. Yeah. And his argument was that, that a lot of people weren't concerned what sort of rat it was. If it was worth sixpence, it was worth sixpence. Yeah. And, and you know, the kids kids would be catching native rats as well. And, and yeah, I don't know how much validity there is in this, but oh, it's like, worth well, bearing in mind. Thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll, send, I'll send you the paper if you like. Oh, yes, I'd love to see that. I genuinely would. Thank you, Ken. So, and just to backtrack on the salt marsh, yeah. so are you familiar with any areas around in the North Sydney LGA that may no. have had salt marsh at all? Because I'm, I'm not. But... No, no, I'm not either. No. Okay. It, it, it's, it's not enough. Um, well, it, it's too rocky down to the foreshore. It's probably for most yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, that's my impression. But there, there, there were people at New South Wales University, and I don't know whether they're still there, a fellow called uh, uh, Associate Professor Paul Adam, uh, who was an expert in that. And if he's okay. still around, he might be able to help. On Thank that. you. But, uh, I, you know, it's, it's been years since uh, since I've talked to him. So. Yeah, I've just written that name down. Thanks, Ken. Okay. I think I've, I've taken enough time. <laughs> well, thanks for your comments and, yeah. Um, I believe uh, Linda had a question. She just raised her hand, Linda Fulsham. Thank you. Thank you, oh. Ian. Hi, and Linda. Thank, hi, hi, Ian. And thank you, Ken. That was very interesting what you had to say as well. Um, I was asking, wanted to ask about the controlled burn at Ball's Head. Oh, when yes. Did it actually start? And how often do they do it? <laughs> I'm not sure. I haven't heard of one for a little while, to be honest. Um, and and I dredged up this photograph from a pile that Tristram passed on to me uh, back in 2010. So I'm estimating a date of 2009. I, I, I would direct you to the website and the new website hopefully will um, help you out better than the old one. Uh, so just put in, type in literally control burn and it'll tell you when the next one is, if there indeed is a next one scheduled, I imagine there is, because it was a reg. I, I recall them being far more frequent in the first decade that I was here, um, but it may be that I've just not been paying attention. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. You're, for your you're, you're welcome. There's, there's um, far more frequent is the fox baiting that goes on. So you may see signs if you're wandering around there referring to 1080. Um, yeah. So that's obviously an attempt to control that and and my understanding has been reasonably successful and correct me if i'm wrong if anyone knows this to be <laughs> an urban myth that the, <laughs> the, the the number of bush turkeys that you see in brush turkeys that you see in north sydney and you see a lot of them um is due to the demise in the fox population but yeah how about that uh, we should get the foxes back <laughs> I love brush turkeys. Don't say that. Ha having said that, the the chickens at Ball's Head, which uh, exist down just below the community gardens, there, are in a very secure Fort Knox-like enclosure. So I suspect that means that there are still some foxes around, um, and they're probably very relieved as a I'm result. Any chances? Yeah. How are we going? Any more? Well, thank you, everyone. If that's, that's it. all, we can probably. So thank you and end it there. So thank you Good. for joining us. And um, this will be available online shortly. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. Thank you.